good evening everyone uh professor you're ready yeah i'm ready okay let me uh, do, uh, put some introductory remarks and we can start huh? Sorry. I'll start with a disclaimer. Uh, I'd hope to talk to Prof before the meeting uh, to clarify a few issues. So unfortunately I wasn't able to. So what I'll say is uh, based on what I gleaned from uh, the internet, uh, mm -hmm. I apologize for any mistakes I might make. I apologize in case anything is not uh, current. It's huh? all right. You, you just, you know, uh, I might, uh, uh, share with you the slides now and you can see the first slide and you can put it more than okay. enough if you want is that all right with you no 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 it's okay let me just give what i have yeah okay so our presenter today is professor Allah ahmed uh he's a specialist in pediatric orthopedics uh and spine su uh, surgery with more than 22 years of uh, experience his special interests are in scoliosis particularly early onset scoliosis, which is going to present on today. He's a professor uh, in several universities, Palestine Polytechnic, uh, Anaj Medical School, as well as Toledo University. Toledo University uh, in USA. Yes. So it's uh, Palestine Polytechnic University in Palestine and Toledo University of Toledo in USA. I'm a professor. In the USA, yes as well as the medical school uh, in South Carolina. Uh, yeah, I was in the medical school until last year. It's for 10 years. I was previously oh, okay. a professor in the medical school of South Carolina. Okay. He's a president elect of World Orthopedic Concerns. He's the chair yes. of the spine committee of uh, CICOT. Yes. He's on the editorial board for the Journal of Pediatric Orthopedics B. Yeah. Uh, the official journal of the uh, Pediatric Asso uh, Orthopedic Association of North America. Yeah. He's a member of various committees uh, of the North American Spine Association. He's an yes. active member of the Scoliosis Research Society, a yes. member of the Growing Spine Committee of the uh, Scoliosis yeah. Research Society. Yeah. He's a previous member of the board of the AO Spine International. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He's currently part of the faculty for the COSEXA uh, Pediatric Orthopedic Program. He yes. has more than 35 published uh, papers and chapters in international peer-reviewed journals, uh, as well as uh, international books. He's the main author of the book, Early Onset Scoliosis, Guidelines for Management and uh, Management in Resource-Limited Settings. Thank you, yes. Professor. That's for more than enough. I mean, that's that's a lot. Thank you very much. Okay. Oh, okay. Uh, welcome. Uh, we are waiting to hear from you. Uh, I'm ready whenever you want. We are ready. Yeah, let's go. Okay. Hello, Professor. Hi. Uh, we are ready for you. There were comments I made were in front of the, uh, the entire group of participants. So we are ready for you. Kindly share your screen. Oh, all right. Oh, oh, thank you very much. So uh, we will, I'll share. So do you see the screen now? Do you see it? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. All we're, right. We're, we're good. All right. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation. Actually, I'm really uh, uh, feeling happy that I'm uh, sharing uh, our knowledge with you in Kenya about early onset scoliosis, which is a subject that uh, it's a new subject that was uh, promoted in the just last two decades. And I'm happy to share with you the ideas, the main ideas about early onset scoliosis. So early onset scoliosis is a term more than a disease, and it's under the umbrella of any spine deformity below 10 years of age. 
according to the SRS uh, definition, Scoliosis Research Society. And it includes all etiologies that might cause this early onset scoliosis, like idiopathic, neuromuscular, syndromic, or congenital. So any child below 10 years of age uh, with spine deformity is called early onset scoliosis. It's not quite common as adolescent idiopathic scoliosis. Usually they say that adolescent idiopathic scoliosis is about 75 to 80% of the scoliosis. But the problem of early onset scoliosis is that it's life-threatening disease and it might affect the lung and the heart and it might cause fatal problems, not like adolescent idiopathic, most of adolescent idiopathic scoliosis. What about the incidence? We have a myth that early onset scoliosis is very small in number that you can neglect in your priorities of management. Well, let's see here from uh, this literature about uh, early onset scoliosis. You can see here uh, there is congenital scoliosis, infantile idiopathic scoliosis, and juvenile idiopathic scoliosis or are within the early onset scoliosis. And we can realize it's about two per thousand. So if we can talk about Kenya, for example, the population here, as you can see from the world meter, is about 55 million people. And if we calculate two per thousand are in the category of early onset, just imagine you have 110,000 children with early onset scoliosis. This is a huge number, especially if we talk about the fatal conditions of early onset scoliosis and the need of early management. De Miglio from France demonstrated that the, uh, about the growth pattern of the vertebra of the spine in general. So in the first five years, there is a rapid progression of the growth of the spine. It's 2.2 centimeters per year. And between it decelerates, they accelerate between five to 10 years of age it become one centimeter per year. And during this period, the normal spine and the lung growth, the lung size will be about 50% of the expected adult lung through alveolar multiplication until the age of age. So if you do something or you have a congenital anomaly, a severe congenital anomaly of the spine, and it would affect the growth of the spine before five years of age, imagine how many centimeters that the child will miss during the growth. And if we know that 50% of the lung uh, growth, normal lung growth, it's until the age of 10 or the age of eight. So anything that will stop the growth will cause catastrophic effect on the lung. So in the past, there was a, a statement that doing a, a shorter uh, straight spine better than longer crooked spine. But when there became, uh, we had more awareness about the importance of the lung growth in these patients, treatment shifted to management to, of spine growth preservation during spine correction, mainly for allowing thoracic cavity and lung growth. They realized that, that it, when you fuse the spine, you don't fuse the spine in these people. You fuse the whole trunk and it will affect the lung growth. So acknowledging the different etiology and potential morbidity and mortality, the impact of management on the child and the family is very important in selecting the type of management. So what's the ideal treatment of early onset scoliosis? It's growth preservation, having mobile growing spine with normal and lung growth and with minimal complication. This is the ideal model of management, how to manage the early onset scoliosis change. So what we have learned in the last two decades, early onset scoliosis is not a spine problem only, but it affects the thorax and the, thorax and the lung growth. And this is the most important aim in any management of early onset scoliosis, preservation of lung growth. Avoid fusion with evolution of non-fusion options. And we'll talk about that later. The importance of casting. And we'll talk about that later and why. So, because there are many surgical techniques, but we still, we don't have consensus about uh, the best surgical technique, there is an increased interest also uh, in uh, doing the casting for the children, at least to prevent or delay the need of early surgery. And in casting Mehta from England, she had uh, described the Mehta angle and how could you know whether 
this child in the infantile idiopathic scoliosis would increase to do to need management or it would not increase. So when you do an X-ray, just a plain X-ray of the child uh, with infantile idiopathic scoliosis, and you put a line through the longitudinal axis of the ribs related to the apex of uh, uh, of the uh, of the scoliosis, which is the most tilted vertebra, and you connect it with a vertical line on the apex. And if the angle here and there, the difference between them is more than 20 degrees, then most probably it's a progressive curve in management. And also the rib phase, what we call it the rib phase, on the convex side, if you see the apical vertebra and the rib on the convex side is going on the uh, uh, apex, so it's most probably it is uh, a progressive curve. But if it's not related to the epic, it's not contacted in contact with the epic, so most probably it's non-progressive and you just watch the child. So you can see here in the mechanism of the progression of the curve that you can see here on the convex side that the thoracic cage is narrowed through uh, the deformity of the rib here and there is a tilting of the vertebra. And this is very important to know how to deal with that. And to how to deal with that with the casting technique that we call it meta casting technique. So what about is crucially important? And we'll talk about that uh, within a few minutes. So you put a shirt, then you put a, a wibril, and if there is a lumbar curve, the hips are slightly flexed to decrease the lumbar lordosis and facilitate uh, curve correction. The most important thing is that the casting, you don't push the ribs on the convex sides toward the spine because you'll narrow the space available for the lung. If we go back, usually the, the mistake that is usually done is that you push the rib in this way. So it will decrease even the already narrowed cage, but you do something else. You do against uh, the deformity, so you'll push the rib anteriorly so as, uh, so as to decrease, to increase the space for the lung. So rather the posterior rotated rib are rotated anteriorly to create a normal chest as much as possible. It's important, it's crucial also, and this is a mistake that is usually done, that you don't do pelvic molding. So the, the, spa, the cast will be like a barrel and it will not be effective. And if the curve is as above T8, so the shoulders are incorporated. I'll show you. So you see here, you rotate. You rotate with the casting and you mold. You push the convex part inferiorly and uh, you push the convex part uh, inferior and you push the concave part anteriorly so as to mold the cast and increase the space for the lung. This is the most important thing. And you can realize here the molding on the pelvic area so as to control uh, the, the deformity. The best results, younger age patient below 18 months of age, moderate curve size below 60 degrees, and idiopathic diagnosis. So just imagine if you have a child with early onset scoliosis with less than 60 degrees and you discover and you cast him or her before 18 months of age, it will be completely therapeutic. If you do that above this age, or if the cast, or if the curve is above 60 degrees, it will delay the surgery. So it's crucial to know about that and to tell your general practitioners, to tell your colleague pediatricians about that and to transfer the patient to the appropriate area where the patient can be managed. Now we'll talk about surgical treatment. Surgical treatment should have the objectives of fulfilling maximum pulmonary function, spine length with minimal hospitalization and minimal complications and minimal family burden. Especially when we talk about the traditional growing rods that you go every six months and put the child under GA to distract the rod and not to cause a tethering of the deformity. So just imagine if you begin with a child four years or five years of age until he or she is 12 or 13, 
you have 16 surgery or 17 surgery. That's not talking about the complications. So you need to have an appropriate plan for these patients. How can we do that? When to plan for surgery? Uh, it's actually from a Columbia University. They have in the literature, they have put modifiers and uh, uh, about the age, etiology, major curve angle, and kyphosis, and the most important part is the progression of the curve. So if the curve is progressing 10 to 20 degrees per year, or if it's progressing more than 20 degrees per year, then definitely this child needs surgery. And there is something called risk severity score. score. Uh, they realized that with, uh, oh, it's also published through Columbia University, that within 171 patients, there are risky factors and which will increase the incidence of uh, surgical site infection, which is catastrophic in spine surgery. And astonishingly, the most risky factor is the child with a syndromic etiology. Then the pulmonary comorbidity. Then if the curve is more than 90 degrees. So it's the third one. And so you need to be a little bit hesitant when you talk about syndromic cases and you need to have full investigations, uh, appropriate plan of management because they already have uh, an increased score of uh, surgical site infection. And they have realized that if you have all risky fact, if you have no risky factor, the incidence of infection early onset scoliosis will be about 60%. If you have all the risky factor, it will be 80%. So we need to plan for it very well. Now for the technological advances, improve the growth-friendly spine implants. What is the meaning of growth-friendly growth spine implants? That means the implants that will preserve growth of the spine during your correction of the spine deformity. So these implants, have, in the literature, there is more and more safety and efficacy in the treatment of early onset scoliosis and in the quality of life of early onset scoliosis children. Now, if we want to plan for early onset scoliosis uh, uh, institution or a department, we need to have always appropriate medical history for the patient. We need to have team assessment. You cannot do this service without having appropriate pediatrician with you, appropriate uh, radiologist that will read the MRI and the ultrasound because 30% of these children are having congenital cardiac problems you need to figure out or you need to tract problems, you need to figure out before doing the surgery. Pulmonary function assessment, you need to have the pediatrician and MRI and CT scan for the spine. For the operative demands, if you want to begin the service, you need to have a spinal tip. It's not necessary. Actually, it's something more of a, a, a model, but you can put towels or strips under the, under the child and it will work. Neuromonitor device, I think we cannot begin service without having a neuromonitor device. Acknowledging that there are many problems with these children that we might not acknowledge uh, previously. Cell saver, it's not necessary if you know how to deal in a surgical way that you'll preserve blood as much as possible and you, you, you need to be very precautious when you do the surgery. Two spine surgeons, of course, are always better than one spine surgeon and trained personnel. I mean the team. Post-operative demand, good finding system. This is very important. In early onset scoliosis, you don't do the surgery and just get the patient back home. He or she need to be followed up for the spinal growth, for the pulmonary growth, and the complications that might happen. Good nursing care, intensive care unit. We usually send the child in the night after the surgery in the intensive care unit for one night. Uh, to avoid any complications that might happen, especially if the ward is not having enough personnel, infection control is highly demanding. So what about the growth-friendly techniques for these patients? We have three main categories, compression-based system, like staples and tethers. We have distraction-based, which is the most popular, growing rods, vector, magic rods. Well, the magic rods are rods that you don't need to get the child every six months to do surgery under general anesthesia, uh, but it's very, very expensive. Each rod is uh, about $10,000 in cost, so you put two rods, it's $20,000. Uh, 
not uh, calculating if the rod is broken and it's very common and you need to change it. And in, in countries with limited resources, I think it's very hard, even in rich countries, it's very hard to do that. The vector is not used as, uh, as before and it's not popular anymore. Still, the traditional growing rod like these rods are still popular until now. Now, the guided growth system, McCarthy and colleagues developed what we call Sheila technique. The main, uh, uh, the main concept of Sheila technique is controlling the apex of the curve and the sliding of the rods above and below. Now, the nightmare of any surgeon who deals with early onset scoliosis is uh, the crankshaft phenomenon. Why is that? Because if you control the, the apex of the curve or the curve from posteriorly, it will still grow anteriorly. So you preserve the height, but you don't preserve the growth posteriorly, and then it will tilt more and more the curve as we can see here. How can you prevent that? So none of these techniques have shown real superiority and the rate of complications remains high. Factors including age, curve severity, curve type, growth remaining, and the child's general health and the ability to tolerate multiple surgery must be considered in relationship to the benefit of continued growth of the spine. Now there are some novel techniques that might have some concepts, like for example, Dr. Miladi from France, he realized that he just put uh, anchors above and anchors below and put one rod on the convex side. He said, and he published that this is very effective that you don't get the child uh, to have massive surgery. But uh, if we talk about the literature uh, and Akbarnia uh, published a paper in 2009 that one rod has a very high incidence of breakage. So everybody now is putting two rods instead of one. Let us talk about this case, for example. This is one of my cases. She has severe deformity. She, is, uh, she was about four years of age. And you can see she was having kyphosis. So if you want to correct the kyphosis and you just put a couple of screws here with an osteoporotic bone, it might dislodge. So what did I do? You can see here with the CT scan, the severe deformity of this child. We put hooks in a clawing fashion. So you don't need to have a dislodgement proximally, and you just put screws distally. So you preserve at, at least uh, the correction to some extent, and you don't have fatal mistakes of having screws that might dislodge or might go in the canal. And I published an article about a growth friendly implants with the rib clawing hooks as proximal anchor in early onset scoliosis. Actually, I usually do it with very, very young children or having very, very osteoporotic bone, that the proximal anchors might not work, and especially in upper thoracic kyphosis. Also, this is a case that we might, I, I, it's one of my cases in Palestine. We have a deficiency of the plastic surgical uh, personnel, and you might have that sometime in your institution in Kenya. What you would do for this case of Milo, you don't need to break the, the skin here. So you just open one small incision here, and two incisions in the area to put screws and the pelvic area. And that's it. So you avoid going through this area without the need of plastic surgery. And you can realize that this is a small incision here, small incision here. So you avoid uh, the need of a plastic surgeon sometimes with your techniques that are within the context of your institution. Now tethering, this is a technique that I established and it's actually uh, uh, a modification of the Sheila technique. Posterior tethering is, the main concept is controlling the apex of the curve, but not like Sheila. Sheila is through fusion, but I do it through modulation and I'll show you how we can uh, have an advantage of this technique. I called it active apex compression uh, correction technique, APC technique. So it, it's the main concept is spinal growth tethering around the apical vertebra, which will lead to asymmetric growth as a mechanism of spine deformity correction in kyphosis and scoliosis. So actually I had a combination of two systems, the guided growth system and the compression based system. And what did I realize? Here is the Sheila technique that you do fusion of three levels in the apex and the gliding of the screws above and below. Well, I did have just uh, screws on the apical part, compressing the most wedge vertebra here as we can see, this is the most, 
actually, I did a CT scan for every case. And with time, I realized that with the modulation, that, for example, the percentage here was 50% between the height of the concave side and the height of the concave side and the convex side, it became 70%. So the vertebra will become more and more quadrant than it was before. And here's a case that I'll show you that I did. Here's the most wedged vertebra, for example. So it's the most tilted vertebra from the line, the plumb line. So I put a screw on the convex side here and here. And we all know as spinal surgeon that it's much, much better, much safer to put screws on the convex side instead of the concave side, which is very hard, especially in very young children, and compress on it. So it will decrease the growth on the convex side and will increase the growth on the concave side. So you can see I, I'm always now uh, shifting more and more to three small incision instead of one big incision. And here are the screws on the lateral side, as you can see. Here are the uh, proximal anchors. And here is the tethering area. You can see one screw above, one screw below the most wedged vertebra. And I compress it here. And so you can see that with the compression, it will decrease the space and it will cause more tethering on the apex. And here is the apex with the yellow circle on. Here's the proximal part, here's the distal part. And the growth, uh, the sliding growth of the rod will be, through, will be through a domino here. Unlocked domino that will give a space at least four centimeters for the rod to continue. And here's the distraction on the concave side. Here's the concave side. You don't touch the concave side in between the proximal and distal anchors and you distract it so as it will increase the growth and you lock it here. So you see, I preserve, I preserve around three to four centimeters of the rod for uh, four years of growth without going back to do distraction. So here is the rod, here is the rod, here is the rod that will slide on the unlocked part of the domino. So it will give uh, four years of not going to surgery and you can see the child after that. Uh, there is another thing now, I do it with the Wilsey technique that you can do uh, minimal bleeding for the child and you can do it with small incisions like this one. You see this child is five years of age, just a small incision here and an incision here, and you connect them with each other with the Wilsey technique. Usually they don't have 100 cc of blood. And you can see this is the child that I did. So these are the distal anchors by coincidence. The curve is on the proximal part is uh, near the distal anchors between T8, uh, T9 and T11. The T10 is the most, and this is a congenital anomaly. And you can realize from 62 degrees, it became about 15 degrees. So it corrects also. And you can see a unilateral bony bar, which is one of the worst uh, deformities. Also, you can see now with the Wilsey technique that we are doing and we are having more experience in, you have three small incisions, even in severe cases like this one that I did with 87 degrees. Usually they talk about Wilson technique that you do it with a 40 or 50 degrees, but now we do it with more than 80 degrees uh, and it gives very good results. So the benefits of the APC technique, zero osteotomies, no screws on the concave side, it's a risky factor. Two screws in, instead of six, financial issue, hybrid technique, cheap and can be done with regular spine implant. And this is one of the most important issues when we deal with early onset scoliosis in countries with limited resources. You are not stuck to specific companies with very expensive implants, and you can do it with just regular implants. All what you need is regular rod, regular screws, regular hooks, regular dominoes that you can have from any country cheaper implants. Avoid recurrent surgeries through rod sliding. And even now we are doing uh, a percutaneous screw sometimes, like in this child, uh, a proximal incision and, and distal incision and percutaneous screws on the convex side. So all of our techniques are to decrease fusion as much as possible 
with minimal uh, disruption of the tissues around the spine. So we did publish papers actually about that. And we had a, a study that we did uh, on uh, the complications on the uh, uh, comparison between traditional growing rods and the APC. And we can realize here that there is no statistical difference between the, th the cases that we did with uh, uh, APC and the ones we did with traditional growing rods, uh, but with the APC, we don't get the child every six months to do surgery. And with the complication, we can see that the APC is less in complication. And we did in the University of Toledo in America, a computational study which promoted our clinical results about this thing. And we proved the modulation of the vertebra. And we had actually uh, two papers that were uh, accepted in the NAS and in the Asia Pacific Pediatric Orthopedic Society related to our uh, study in the University of Toledo. So in conclusion, treatment of early onset scoliosis is challenging. It's a heterogeneous population and no consensus is established yet about the management. And it's important to understand the concepts. This is the most important, understand the concepts behind treatment of early onset. So it's not just the spine, it's the lung growth. Cornerstone of treating early onset, early onset scoliosis is facilitation of optimal condition for lung development. Spinal fusion should be postponed as much as possible. There is more awareness about the holistic approach with uh, consideration of the impact of multiple treatment interventions in early life on overall development. And operative complications can be reduced through techniques, through sliding rods that you can do. Finally, Stick to the principles, refer to the, pa the patient, to the appropriate specialist. Do the surgery within the scars that you have, but stick to the principles. Do what is more appropriate related to your experience. Please don't shift to what's always said in the Congress. Just do it within the appropriate guidelines, but within the context of your institution. Don't hesitate to ask for help. And uh, we did a blended learning course. Some of you in Kenya actually joined us in uh, the blended learning course about early on scoliosis. It was under the umbrella of Will Cornell. And actually, I gave the part of the early onset scoliosis. And we published a book. Uh, it was uh, published uh, by Taylor and Francis in England, Early Onset Guidelines in Management of Resource Limited Settings. That is more to talk about low middle income countries. How can we uh, establish this service within uh, the context of these countries? Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Professor, for the very informative talk. Uh, we'll invite questions. Yes. Uh, members, Kindly uh, unmute yourself and give any questions that you may have. Hello, Dr. Kimani. And now I'll pick on the people who do spine. Uh, Dr. Kimani, any questions? Uh, well, I had a question actually from Hussaina uh, about the brace versus cast on early onset scoliosis. If I may answer this question, is that all right? It's on the chat, actually. Is that okay? Yes, kindly, Professor, answer the uh, yeah. question. Well, uh, for the bracing, uh, well, for the casting, casting, you can mold it. And you can control it much better than the brace. This is one thing. But of course, the brace, if it's done very well, it can give a, 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 some benefit. But uh, let me tell you about our experience here in Palestine. Uh, you don't have many people who are really skillful in doing the brace. Uh, some of them, uh, the prosthetic and orthotic people do a barrel-shaped brace, which is not right. 
or put compression in sites which are not right. And so, uh, and it's expensive, unfortunately, but with the cast, you can do it by yourself. And I eager every spine surgeon to do the cast by him or herself. Unfortunately, because it's not uh, something like uh, a macho guy, like the surgery, uh, some of the people, highly experienced, don't like to put the brace, though it's very important to do that by the most skillful people and train the people about appropriate cast. This is what I say. For the corset, there is no, no role of a corset, actually. And in early onset, but I'll tell you about the difference in casting or bracing. If you do it for infantile idiopathic scoliosis, it's much better to do it with casting. But in any other types of scoliosis, like congenital or syndromic, you tell the family that it might delay surgery, but it's not therapeutic. Well, uh, okay, thank, thank you, you George, yeah, uh, uh, about what are your long term. Uh, surgical results. Uh, I did publish about six paper about six papers about midterm results because the APC technique I began it in 2013. So I cannot say about uh, long term results about 10 years or 20 years. Uh, but uh, you can go to the published paper and it's very uh, good results and very clear results in comparison to, to the traditional growing growth. Yes, the cast is applied. Actually, we say, we usually said every six months, change the cast. This was the time of Mehta. But Sanders have done a classification, which I think is more appropriate, is to change the cast before two years of age every two months uh, to control the uh, infantile idiopathic scoliosis. But if the situation doesn't uh, uh, make it possible to do that, you can do it every six months to change the cast under GA. Until, until the child is fully corrected in infantile idiopathic scoliosis, or there is a delay of the surgery until the child is fit for surgery in other types of adolescent scoliosis. Uh, these are the chat questions, if somebody wants to ask orally. Okay, any member with a question? Dr. Gakuya has uh, sent a question to the chat. Kindly, Professor, answer that. Uh, I'm sorry? Uh, Dr. Uh, Gakuya. Yeah. Has yeah. Sent a After question correction, to the chat. do you remove? Well, this is another thing that changed with time. In early onset school, we used to say 10 years ago that uh, uh, when you do, uh, the, we, we call them the graduate, uh, the graduate patients. If we, uh, we used to say 10 years ago that when the child becomes having full skeletal growth, you remove the previous implants and you do final fusion with bigger implants. Now it's not like that. If the child is compensated and having no problem, you can just leave the implants. Or if you want to remove the implants without having added added procedure like new fusion or something like that. You might do that, but you must tell the family that you might have an increased incidence of going back to a deformity and you check it within one month or up to six months. If the child uh, goes back to have a deformity, you need to get him or her back to surgery and do final fusion. Or if the child is decompensated because your main uh, objective in the surgery is to have uh, to preserve the growth of the lung and preserve as much as possible of the spine. If the child is decompensated, then after graduation, you might correct the curve and do final fusion. Uh, these are the three possibilities for the graduate patients. But until now, we don't have a definite protocol for uh, this patient. We don't have a consensus. There's another question from uh, Dr. Stan as well as Dr. Gakuya. Yes, well, this is, this is the thing I want you to know in Kenya. 
is that this is an excellent question uh, from Stan Kinch. Uh, you know, in, in our countries, uh, if we want to begin early onset scoliosis, I would really uh, focus on casting in the beginning. Casting is safe. You can uh, have therapeutic results, true therapeutic results for infantile idiopathic scoliosis. And at least you can delay the surgery for the cases that you cannot do or you don't have enough, enough resources to do or enough skills to do until you are trained by somebody coming to your country or going to somewhere to uh, know the uh, procedures and to train about them. So casting is, but we need to know the principles of casting and how to do it. And, but you cannot do casting, for example, of, for a, a case of an 80 or 90 degrees of scoliosis. So the casting is very important for 20 degrees, 30 degrees, something like that, but it's not an option for severe scoliosis. You just need to send the patient for surgery. No. Uh, no, it's not necessary that the level of core termination after maturity differ from normal. Any other question? Do you have any other members with any questions? Okay, thank you, Professor, for the very informative uh, talk. Uh, it was a real honor for you to uh, speak to us. We hope to meet you during our annual conference and during the CICOT uh, SRS and NAS uh, meetings once this resume. Thank you, Professor. Uh, th thank you very much for having me. And I'm really... Uh... Happy to share with you the ideas about beginning establishing early onset scoliosis services in our countries. And uh, you know, there is a question, are there resources available to learn the casting technique? Of course, uh, actually uh, on part of the blended learning course that we have done, uh, I'll come to Tanzania for uh, one week uh, hands-on uh, scoliosis surgeries, but because we realize the importance of casting, that we'll do casting for some patients beside the surgery uh, for adolescent idiopathic cases. So everybody in, who uh, uh, were engaging or were participants in the blended learning course would see, we'll do some uh, videos about that and you'll see it. And maybe if I can, if I come in, to Kenya to join your uh, Kenya Orthopedic Association annual meeting, we might do one case or two cases. It's very easy to do and very easy to learn. And we might begin with that. Uh, okay. Thank you very much. And uh, hopefully we can, I can see you in Kenya on uh, the beginning of October in, during your annual Congress. And uh, some of you I might see in Tanzania in the OR when I do the one weekends on uh, surgery for school cases. Thank you very much okay. for having me. Okay. Uh, thank you, Professor. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Have a good night. Good night to you too, and good night to everybody. Thank you very much.